Welcome to the Regent Brands Podcast. This is a place for consumers, operators, and investors to learn about the consumer brands supporting regenerative agriculture and how they're changing the world. This is your host, Kyle, joined by my co-host, AC, who's going to take us into the episode. On this episode, we have Will Burke, who is the founder and CEO at Soul Simple. Soul Simple is supporting regenerative agriculture with its regenerative organic certified dried tropical fruit products and its broader ecosystem of enterprises working with 1,200 smallholder farmers in Nicaragua. In this episode, we learn about Will's journey from educator to entrepreneur and why he had to build multiple businesses and tons of infrastructure to support the commercialization activities of his farmer partners. This is such an amazing story of systems thinking, true farmer partnership, poverty alleviation, and social development through business. Ah, it was so cool to hear it from Will. We hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Let's dive in. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Regen Brands podcast. Super excited today to have our friend Will from Soul Simple with us. So welcome, Will. Thank you. Thanks, AC. Hi, Kyle. How are you guys doing? We're doing well, man. You know, AC and I are uh, living in first world country lives right now. Uh, you're coming to us <laughs> live from Nicaragua, uh, where there's no AC, it's hot, doors are open, dogs are barking. So we're setting the expectation for our listeners that this is coming from an authentic place of regeneration. Um, yes. So Amen. here we are. Um, so for those who are not familiar with Soul Simple, well, give us a quick lay of the land. Like what sort of products do you make? Where can people find you today? What's distribution look like? You know, just give us a high level. Yeah, uh, Soul Simple is a brand of um, regenerative certified or regenerative organic certified dried fruit. It's solar dried fruit uh, focused on tropicals, mango, pineapple, banana, dragon fruit. Um, and uh, we, we've we got about seven SKUs, uh, family pack and snack size that's in uh, mostly the East Coast and also the West Coast. We're in Whole Foods on the East Coast and some independents and uh, smaller chains on the West Coast. Uh, we've had the brand for about... Ooh, 13 years now, 14 years. And it's grown nice. slowly and slowly um, just through, you know, or, organic growth and, and marketing. Um, but uh, it's got a, a cult following, I think, over in New York, especially. Um, yeah. As, and it's been known as one of the tastier uh, dried fruits out on the market because we focus mostly on heirloom varietals, uh, which has been really helpful. But, Ooh, but that's, nice. that's, that's mostly what it is. Solar dried organic fruit, fair trade, regenerative organic certified. I need you to, to double click on two things for me here. Number one, what are the fruit flavors? And number two, what is solar dried? Uh, so uh, again, we're, we're on tropical. So we focus mostly on mango, which is our number one seller. So solar dried organic mango, pineapple, banana, and pitaya, which most people know as dragon fruit, but uh, yeah. usually it's, it's known as pitaya, spelled with an H, pitahaya. Um, and... Uh, Oh, sorry. I forgot the second question. <laughs> what? Solar dried. Yo, solar, yeah. So solar dried. So there's a difference between sun drying and solar drying. Sun drying is like your sun dried tomatoes that you buy at the supermarket. Or if you're in Italy, you can go buy them at the, you know, the farmer's market, whatnot. Um, and that's a product that's uh, dried out in the sun. So it's exposed to all the elements and food safety issues that could happen um, in an open environment. Solar dried is using solar technology to heat air and draw that solar heated air down through a manifold and then circulate it in, in our cabinet dryers. Um, so it reduces our carbon footprint. Um, it uh, also potentially, you know, depending on what kind of um, temperature we're using, could also increase um, the level of nutrients and enzyme activity um, if we were to dry it at the raw level in terms of temperature. Um, and it's, uh, you know, since we're reducing our, our consumption of propane, um, then there's potentially mm. a taste factor that that's increased. So it's solar heated air, naturally mm. heated, that doesn't have this burn, uh, potential yeah. burn taste or aftertaste that would come through that. that the, for for the audience, for the audience that hasn't had this product, like this is not your uncle's banana chip. Like that that's my favorite product <laughs> of yours, Will is is the banana. It's not like a hard going to break your tooth like chip. It is a dry piece of fruit that still has some moisture. And it's almost like it eats like candy to me. Like it, it's, it's truly a phenomenal product. Ah, oh, thanks AC. It's, you know, I don't eat bananas, but our banana is my favorite product. 
it's, it's yeah it's <laughs> ironic but but it's true it's true who doesn't it's eat really bananas tender. will you're freaking me out man i, yeah, I don't know it's, <laughs> good point but bananas are i just i don't know i can never handle them yeah i still can't but these They're are phenomenal. these are amazing thank you thank yeah. you yeah so Will, two questions. I want you to take us into the origin story because you're obviously not from Nicaragua. So how did you get down there? How did you do this work? I know a lot of it comes from a social development angle. So definitely want to give you time and space to share that story. But just really quick for the further background, there's two other entities that are part of this ecosystem that you've built beyond just Soul Simple, the brand. So what are those two entities and how do they how do they work with Soul Simple, the brand? Yeah, um, thanks, AC. So um, I moved to Nicaragua about 25 years ago and I came down mm -hmm. as a, as a as a teacher, as an educator, um, yeah. I studied education uh, for a number of reasons um, back in Chicago, where I'm from. And uh, there's a whole other side story of why Nicaragua, et cetera. But anyway, so I found myself here in Nicaragua working at the U.S. Embassy School, uh, teaching mm -hmm. you know the sons and daughters of foreign nationals and, and locals as well, uh, teaching English Lit, which is you know a, a subject I love. And um, yeah. I was here for two years. Went to uh, grad school at CU in Boulder um, in education as mm -hmm. well, and then moved to Venezuela for six years. And again, wow. went to the U.S. Embassy School there. And I moved to, to Venezuela in 2001 with my wife. And there was okay. six months after Chavez took power. Um, and so we were there for mm. six years, had two kids. And you know, most people know what the disaster is that Venezuela became. And um, so we, we had you know, a, a toddler and a baby at that time. And so depending on the week, we couldn't get milk, sugar, coffee, meat, chicken, uh, flour, wow. you name it. Yeah, it was, it was pretty brutal. I mean, we were living a great lifestyle, going to the beach all the time and traveling everywhere. Yeah. Um, but uh, it just it just became a grind and, and we just got tired of it. And so we thought, well, okay, we can move. Um, we could try somewhere else in, in Latin America or go to Asia or whatnot and continue the overseas teaching yeah. gig, or we could look at potential business opportunities. And my wife was born in Nicaragua. Um, dad's from okay. Key West and her, her mom's Nicaraguan, but she grew up in Miami because of the revolution that happened in, in the eighties here in Nicaragua. So, um, she and I thought, well, you know, we got these two kids, <laughs> we could go back to Nicaragua. <laughs> Uh, and have, you know, my in-laws help us raise them. And then, you know, like for vacation time, we can, we don't split vacations so much. We get up to the States, give our kids more yeah. of, a, you know, like roots in the U S they can feel that, mm -hmm. you know, we can feel maybe more as American, I guess is, mm -hmm. is sort of what the goal was. And so, so we decided to do it, but what was going to be the vehicle to get us there? And I said, look, I've always, I, one of the reasons I got into education was because I felt that, um, if I get into business, right away well, during mm. college, um, I might always regret not having tried education. So I'd always love kids, always work with them. Mm. And, and I thought, you know, if I do that um, and I don't like business and I want to try education later on, I'm going to have to go back to college. I'm going to have to get my degree. I'm going to have to, you know, yeah. study for the, to get a teaching certificate, apply to get a master's. And then we can get paid probably a fourth of what I was making, <laughs> you know, selling fax <laughs> machines or whatever it was I was going to end up doing. Yeah. <laughs> and so I thought, well, why don't, why don't I try education first and then I can go into business later? Cause you know, no one, anyone can start a business. So I did, yeah. I, I taught for, for 10 years and I just, I just said, Hey Maria, my wife, you know, maybe it's time that I, I try my hand at something and I want to start a business mm. that gives back in Nicaragua. What, you know, let's brainstorm some ideas. And originally yeah. I was thinking like maybe coming up with a consulting service, like working with the Nicaraguan government or some sort of NGO that worked in literacy. Um, and, and so we were brainstorming all sorts of ideas. And my wife just said, how about dried mango? And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what, is that? what does that have to do with teaching kids how to read? <laughs> and she's like, remember uh, we were on the beach, you know, a long time ago in Nicaragua and we saw mangoes rotting on the ground. And we just talked about how in Boulder mm. people are paying 15 bucks a pound for organic dried mango at, at you know, the whole food mm. or alfalfas. I was like, yeah. She's like, yeah. well, you know, there's tons of mangoes in Nicaragua. What, like, what do you think about trying fruit? And so it's a long story from there as to wow. like how, how it all evolved. But, but I connected with a couple of NGOs. I was flying out to Nicaragua from Caracas and, and really starting to cobble together a business plan. Um, and, and I did it. And, and part of it was focusing on merging 
commercial drying technology with, um, at the time, what was available, um, solar technology used to heat air. And there, there are not a lot mm. of products out there. So I do a lot of research mm. with like the FAO and with um, even the Peace Corps, looking at these artisanal solar dryers, wow. and like little pinball machines and stuff. And so, again, it's a long story, but but it took a lot of innovation and then and then to create recreate what's been done at, at like the cottage industry on an industrial level and and then come up with yeah. a budget for it. Um, and so that that's what I did. Uh, wow. And then it took me like a year while I was still in in Venezuela, just working weekends and nights, and then. And then I put it together and, and uh, moved to Venezuela, or sorry, moved to Nicaragua to, to make it happen and, and piece it together. Wow. All with the idea. So the genesis of it was to connect smallholder farmers to a sustainable market. And that's all I wanted to do. And again, it, like, Love that. I'll tell one quick story about it is I never really wanted to have a, a processing plant. I wanted to provide the technology yeah. to growers. And, and I mentioned like these pinball mm. machines earlier and have these like a, about a hundred solar dryers out in the field and all i would do is like drive around mm. and, and collect the fruit like every week yeah. um and then you know it, maybe i'd have to go pack it somewhere and then ship it up to the u.s so i wanted to add value yeah. at the farm level as much as i could and then i didn't know anything about food safety but <laughs> once i started reading about it like, <laughs> that's not gonna work. there's yeah, yeah. Who's, who's gonna buy that like, you know so yeah um and again then the next step was looking at gender equity and trying to empower single mothers in a community and, and try to get them to run a plant. And there are some legal issues mm. that I couldn't get that done. But, but in the end, I saw this idea had legs and I'm like, well, you know, I never wanted to become a, a plant owner. I just felt like I'd be good on the marketing side to provide the solution for yeah. them. Um, but I, you know, this idea is pretty good. So I'm just going to do it. And I committed all the capital I had to, to get it done and invested in the technology. Let's go. So, yeah. Let's yeah. go. That's awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I, number one, I want to say, you know, as you're giving the origin story, I was waiting for the curveball because everything you were talking about, like to me, like there was no path to food. There was going to be some weird, like 90 degree turn in that story. Yeah. And, uh, I love that you did, you know, saw mangoes on the ground and like, Hey, let's, let's start, start with mangoes. Um, I also yeah, no wanted to kind all. of, right, you know, <laughs> you know it, it's, it's, it's an interesting way to start a business. You know, there's mangoes here. Yeah. I know that people want mangoes there to connect the dots, right? It's simple. Um, sometimes you don't need to validate common sense, right? You know? Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. Um, I do want to dig in. You mentioned it's a long story, like with the solar powered drying technology, I want to kind of just without getting into all of the logistical parts of the story, but why was that important to you in integrating that solar technology into your business, you know, from like the inception point and what, what what year was that? Uh, 2006 is when I finally, yes, yeah, 2007 okay. is when I moved to Nicaragua to, to, to yeah. uh, launch so it. This is early. Yeah. This is before solar was, you know, some big, some big thing then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There I mean, wasn't this, a lot of technology before it was a big thing there. in the U S let alone Nicaragua. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There are no, there's, there are some businesses or whatever that were selling PV cells and panels. That's about mm. it, you know, but, but mm. solar drying technology was totally new here. Um, uh, so sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> so why, why was that important to you from like, uh, you know, you're already developing a business where you're exporting, you're doing something you've never done before. And then you decide to throw in this additional difficult problem to solve <laughs> and incorporating solar. And to me, there must be like a, a foundational why you wanted to do that. And I want to, I want to hone in on that. Yeah, it really came from my time in Boulder. Um, you know, I, I'm a Chicagoan, I, I'm a meat and potatoes kind of guy and being in grad school in Boulder, I just, I, I learned to eat better. I learned much more about yeah. food, health, diet, exercise. Um, I'm a big skier. You know, that's one of the reasons I was out there. I was, I was a ski instructor for a long time. Um, but, but I never really got to live it so much mm-hmm. like, like I did in grad school. And, and part of it is in Boulder, it's a fascinating town. It's, you know, it's, it's the atomic clock is there. The national regenerative or renewable energy laboratory is there. And, yeah. um, I just got to learn more about it through osmosis, really. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this, I want to make sure I'm doing it right. And and I need to differentiate ourselves a little bit from the other suppliers. I knew Mango was coming out of Mexico, and I was pretty certain that there was nothing mm. really um, innovative coming coming from these, these farms, yeah. these Mango farms in Mexico. And so I thought, well, you know, um, Nicaragua is so sunny. There's There's got to be some some 
way I can use renew renewable energy in, mm -hmm. in this business model. And, and so that's what it came from is really just knowing about the new, the national laboratory for renewable energy, um, in Boulder and, and just starting to read about it. Like just guys curious. Um, and then lo and behold, there's, there's actually some literature out there about solar drying, which was cool <laughs> and really helpful. So I went to Google university and, and figured out just based yeah. on my own curiosity <laughs> from that time. Really, Good old GU. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So totally. Well, what what was V one? Was V one you bought like a small facility or you were paying rent at a small facility and you had like one drying machine and you were just doing mangoes and you were selling them as an ingredient, you're selling them direct to consumer? Like what was V one as you built this? Yeah, and so you know, you you mentioned the three different companies earlier. And so the yeah. V one, V two, and V three is really the like the um, yeah. evolution of us <laughs> opening up other companies. So it's it's a great place to start. So V one was um, me driving around Nicaragua in a pickup truck and trying to identify growers, smallholder farmers yeah. that had uh, mango and then, you know, pineapple and banana. And, you know, I, I knew we couldn't just have a one trick pony. I needed mm -hmm. other fruit. Um, but it was it was driving around. Um, meanwhile, looking for a plant that I could rent a small one, you know, like, yeah. like 3000 square feet. Um, and also importing the, the dryer from Colombia, importing the solar panels from Canada um, and making sure all that's up and running. Um, and then just wow. um, drying conventional fruit, just buying the different varietals. You know, is, are we going to work with an MD2 pineapple or a Monte Lirio pineapple? And yeah. you know, what, um, trying to find out, like sort of take a census of what's available in the country of these different varietals mm -hmm. um, and then how far it is. So V1 was, was me really just driving around buying mangoes, putting them in the, in the bed of the pickup, um, asking yeah. questions about... Well, when you Spanish drove around, did you lay on the horn as much as the people who are driving by your place right now? <laughs> you can hear Is that, that just like a way of life in Nicaragua? <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Hey! Yeah. Mangoes! <laughs> um, right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's, uh, you know, it, it evolved, like, to me, starting to, you know, research also organic farming because I knew I didn't want to work with, mm. with conventional practices. And so we wanted to evolve, mm -hmm. I wanted to evolve into organic farming, but it didn't really exist here. And um, one of the concepts that I came up with was, you know, a lot of these farmers were poor organic. They were organic just by mm. default because they're so impoverished that, that mm -hmm. they couldn't afford agrochemical inputs. And, and mm. so it created an opportunity for me to say, hey, I think, I can, I think we can work together I'm going to find some organic inputs for you and we're going to see if your production bumps up. Um, and, mm. and, you know, I'll just provide this on credit and, and, um, you know, let's work together to see if, if, if there's, you know, like a, you know, a low risk model where, um, we can provide new opportunities to access the market for you and, and provide some value with eventual certification. I, I was hoping, imagining, dreaming. Um, and so, so that was basically V1. Yeah. It was me really doing all the purchasing, me hiring just three people in our plant um, to process the, the mangoes and the pineapple and bananas eventually. Um, and then on the market side, V1 was, um, I was just looking at co-ops like in Minnesota and, and Washington, Oregon, and trying to get our product into a bulk bin in, in those, those states in, in co-op grocery stores. Okay. And so unbranded, you're selling bulk. No brand, no yeah. packaging, like big bulk packages into like those, those big containers. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, you know, I, I th there's, there's another part of the story. I can maybe tell it in between one and two, but, um, I, I had a little bit of experience in marketing when I was, when I was in college, um, and I'd go to trade shows and stuff. So like, I thought, you know, I don't, I don't think I could afford to start a brand. It wasn't, it didn't even cross my mind, honestly, Kyle. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to get that product to market and I knew like, you know, the bulk sales would probably be best, but mm -hmm. now, now I was starting to do it and I was seeing what our, our cost structure was, <laughs> but we were getting hammered, hammered. There's yeah. no way I could compete with Mexico, um, in Africa. And, you know, back then it was like mm -hmm. 350 a pound. It was costing me like 550 a pound, um, to process. Wow. And, and they, they were buying, yeah, in, in California and LA for like 350 pounds back then. You know, it's gone up since. But, wow. Um, yeah, so there's no way we compete. And, and I was, 
you know, generating some sales and stuff is $15,000 a first year, $35,000 a second year, $75,000 a third year. Let's go. Um, and nice. Yeah. Oh, yo, oh, yeah. Hockey stick. Hey. <laughs> yeah. It's hey. Lovely. You got to build and, it somehow, it man. Two, 2008. So it was worse still. Yeah. Um, oh, man. So, you know, 2007 was when I launched and we opened, when I started selling the product in 2008. And that was in, you know, that was when we had $17,000 in sales. Um, so, so it was, it was, it was pretty tough. And, and that's where version two starts. Cause I realized that, you know, this bulk, these bulk sales, you know, are just going to cut it. I need to add value. Um, mm -hmm. we have more value proposition better said, yeah. and I need to add margin and how am I going to capture yeah. that margin is by having your own brand, which is differentiated in the market. And there weren't too many, it, the space wasn't too crowded. So mm -hmm. I, I created a brand called soul simple. Um, so the first company is called Burke Agro because that's that's mm. all I really want to do is work with growers and connect them to the market. And um, mm. so this the second company that I started in Chicago is called Soul Simple, which is now our importer and our brand. And the idea behind that was just become the face of all of the social environmental impact work that we're doing in Nicaragua. And this before I even yeah. knew what a social enterprise was, or you know, it wasn't yeah. the face, it wasn't even a term. But I was starting to realize I have. I started a social enterprise. I, I had a company mm -hmm. that um, really created a lot more impact than, than I ever really could have imagined, had a lot more potential creating impact and yeah. could draw um, consumers, but also um, supporters and investors um, because of the work, the development work that we're doing in Nicaragua. Right. And Nicaragua is the second poorest country in the hemisphere. It's next to Haiti. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. 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 Th think about that for a minute. That. So the amount yeah. of opportunity here for social impact development and looking at market-based solutions for poverty alleviation were incredible. Um, and that's, and that's, that's cool. really what, what drives me. Um, so mm -hmm. I created Soul Simple to tell the story of the farmer um, and to mm -hmm. tell the story of, of the work that needs to be done um, and, and presented it through a really tasty, delicious, uh, product that has a great aroma when you open the bag. Um, and that's mm -hmm. a good for you snack as well. Um, and so it, it worked and we got into whole foods and we got into a bunch of markets in on the West coast as well. And, and, you know, just because of all of our resources really going into, um, rural development and farmer development, we haven't invested much in marketing. And so soul simple is still today, mm -hmm. just kind of coasts along, you know, gets, a little more notoriety year over, year over year, but now we're starting to invest yeah. in the brand um, a little bit more uh, to tell that story. Um, but during version two, so I'm, now I've skipped into V2, but during that time, we also diversified into B2B. And in B2B, mm -hmm. we discovered um, through fruit juices and purees that we could create a mm -hmm. lot more volume through the capacity that we have in our plant and have a lot more impact in the field. Um, so through volume and high volume, we increase impact, yeah. we increase revenue, we increase you know, our margin, we get better, and then we can keep reinvesting in, in the work that we're doing in Nicaragua. And so that's, so that's where Soul Simple kind of has been missing out, not ignored, but neglected, mm. um, in, in us yeah. really investing so much in that brand is because there's so much work to do here and it's, and it's really capital intensive. Today, we've got uh, about 16 agronomists that are out in the field every day working with 1200 growers. Um, and that's part wow. of where V3 comes in, but I'll, I'll pause there for a second because that's yeah. really a lot to chew on. No, it's a, it's a really great story. And I appreciate, you know, it feels like, like you mentioned, the driver here is really that social impact poverty alleviation mm -hmm. tool that, you know, Soul Simple is sort of serving as. Um, I'm really curious to better understand how and when regenerative became a part of that conversation and how you married those two things with like the on ground impact with some of that social development that you've been talking about. So, yeah. you know, one of the questions we really like to ask people, yeah. you know, people have like this aha moment with regenerative. So like, what was that for you? How and when did you start to incorporate that into your business? So there, um, two, two issues kind of came up at the same time as, um, I had a lot of conversations with Michael Besanson from Whole Foods. I don't know if you fellows know who he is, but mm -hmm. um, he had no. just retired and he came down to visit me. He was he was the operations manager of Whole Foods and um, okay. uh, basically like the number, th number three guy was responsible for 
uh, incredible growth and like opening up um, new locations. I think under him, they opened up, I, I'd be making up the number, but a lot. Um, yeah. And so he, he went into retirement and he wanted to work on, on uh, a mango project in um, Mozambique. And um, somehow I got in touch with him when I was in Haiti. It was right after the earthquake in Haiti. And um, mm. I, I was hired to consult on, on developing mango value chains in Haiti because of the work that I did in Nicaragua. So yeah. um, through that work, uh, Michael and I started, started speaking and he wanted to come down and visit me. And so he and I started talking a lot about our, our ag program. So in Nicaragua, we're the first company to certify anything outside of coffee as organic. We're the first company, wow. uh, one of the first companies in the world actually to get fruit as Fairtrade certified, Fairtrade USA certified. Um, wow. Definitely the first in Nicaragua. We're the first B Corp. And so, um, you know, I think Michael was, um, you know, curious about, about how we were able to do this and, and want to know more about our, our extension work with our growers in Nicaragua and yeah. what that meant and then what the farming practices were that, that we were focused on. And so when he was here, he started talking about regenerative agriculture and I didn't, I mean, I didn't know what it was. And um, give us a, give I, us like a quick year here. What, what time period are we talking about? This is 2012 about okay. roughly. Um, mm -hmm. So we're already in Whole Foods and, you know, we're, we're clipping along. We've got our B2B business. And you're certified organic at that side. point, Will? Yeah. Yeah. And so there's you're a whole story organic. there about how, how we had to do that. Um, Cause um, it's just like I never wanted to have a processing, processing plant. I never wanted to have an agricultural yeah. development team, but mm. here in Nicaragua, we were a square pig trying to fit in a round hole with NGOs. When I first came, I thought right. that NGOs would do this work for us. NGOs are non-government organizations for our listeners. And, mm. and there's a lot of, a lot of development money in Nicaragua, you know, being the second poorest country in the hemisphere, yeah. there's a lot of development money, but no one wanted to develop. None of these NGOs funded by your tax dollars wanted to develop, um, fruit, organic fruit value chains here. And so I ended up having to do the work mm -hmm. myself. And so that, that's why it became so capital intensive. Yeah. Um, I just never, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I went in with the assumption that, that someone else would do it for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and I didn't. So I had to hire an agronomist and then another agronomist and another agronomist and, and for them to begin to do that extension work with through workshops. And then we created, um, uh, credit programs and input programs and got our growers to become bankable. Um, and so Michael understood all wow. of this through our conversations. And so he wanted to come witness it and see, see how it was organized. And um, that's where we started talking about regenerative ag. And, and then mm -hmm. I started communicating with, with our, with our, with our agronomists and our field team manager mm -hmm. about it. And they didn't really know what it was, but they understood it because they said, well, Will, we actually already have some growers that work in agroforestry systems. Why don't we go take a look at those guys and those mm. ladies? Mm. And um, and so I started learning more about it on the ground. And Michael was right there looking at it. He, said he, he was pointing out practices that are, you know, good and maybe questionable or whatever. But um, but he was sharing wisdom with us as well. And so that's when I thought, okay, mm. there's we we can do more. And mm. around the same time, that's when there are little murmurs of the USDA potentially considering approving. Um, hydroponic as, as being organic or potentially mm -hmm. organic certified. And mm -hmm. so there are more and more uproars. I started attending um, conferences to learn more about it. And I, I went to the first regenerative or, or uh, regenerative earth summit. Uh, and I went mm -hmm. to it every year after that. And so I became more and more involved until, um, and I assume we'll get into this later, but until I learned about the regenerative organic certification. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, through a, a partner at the time of ours, we, uh, we decided to, um, focus on that and become the first regenerative organic certified fruit brand and value mm -hmm. chain in the world. And that, and that led us up to 2019. So between 2012 and 2019, that was my, my learning journey, um, inspired by Michael Bassanson. Um, and then mm -hmm. there was a lot that happened in between, but, but kind of bumping into version three or, um, it was it was then when I said, okay, we want to become regenerative organic certified. And there's a lot more work for us to do that Burke Agro, that base company was also our processing mm -hmm. company in Nicaragua. And I decided mm -hmm. to split them apart. I said, we need a processing company that that's all it does. And we need a development company that that's all it does. And, um, mm -hmm. it was really helpful. So we, we split them up and that's when solar organica was born. 
So we've got Burke mm -hmm. Agro that, that provides all the credit, all the inputs, et cetera. And, and then it, it purchases all the raw material um, and then sells it to Solar Organica. Solar Organica transforms it. It's, that's its sole purpose. And then it exports to you know, around the world, um, all the different products that, that we're processing. And that all happened basically in 2018, 2019. And that's when the regenerative organic certification came out. So it was perfect timing that, that we separated them out. And so we had just one team that that's all they did was focus on, on growers. And so that's when our team grew from maybe 11 agronomists to 16 to 18. We've now been able to dial it back a little bit just through efficiencies, but, but um, that's, that's how it happened. And then Soul Simple is the third member in that, in that integ or vertical integration where it's the importer, it's the, it's the brand face, and, and it's the, the one that every once in a while you'll see out at trade shows in the US. Yeah. So cool, man. Kudos on, on all that. And it's so aligned with, I think, our biggest takeaway from doing this show, which is regenerative brands, regenerative enterprises, regenerative ecosystems, whatever. They are all designed with farmer livelihoods and ecology at the table, whereas most of the businesses we see in this space today in the CBG space are not. And it's so evident in the work that you have done. Um, I'm going to ask you I'm going to ask you a dense question here before we go into ROC and, and kind of bring us to present day. And I'm trying to decide in my brain how I want to ask it, but I really want to get to two things for the audience, right? High level from an agronomic standpoint, how is one of the farms that you're sourcing from, you know, how have you helped them be different or, or how are they more regenerative or what practices or, or whatever at a high level versus someone that may be a commodity grower in Nicaragua or, or growing something else because they don't have these resources, right? And then from a social perspective, how have these enterprises that you've built changed, you know, uh, economic outcomes for farmers, but also maybe some of the people that are working in the processing facility or something like that. I just, I want to just double tap a little bit more on agronomics and the social impact of the enterprises itself. Yeah, sure. So, you know, as I mentioned, some of the farmers we worked with, even from the very, very beginning had agroforestry systems, I mean, I didn't even yeah. know what an agroforestry system was at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I knew, I oh, just want to pause and acknowledge that real quick. Sorry to interrupt, Will, but you know, this goes back to another recurring theme that we have on the podcast. And it's like, you know, giving indigenous wisdom, like the shout out for people who have been doing this stuff before the term regenerative existed. It's great that we now mm -hmm. get to market that. And it's like this like recognized term, mm -hmm. at least to some degree. But, you know, mm -hmm. it does feel a little bit um, imperialistic that we now mm -hmm. call this regenerative and we take their practice and say, hey, now we can wrap it up in this bow. When yeah. in numerous countries around the world, people have been doing it right from the get go. So I just want to call that out and acknowledge it real quick. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, th thanks, Kyle. No, absolutely, and and that's and that's what we found in the conversations with the growers. They they acknowledge that this is how my father farmed. This is how my grandmother and yeah. my grandfather farmed. And I just know that that my soil is more fertile when it's done this way. And this is how the farm was handed to me. And I'm not going to change their practices. So there there are a lot mm. of cases like that. And so many times we were learning from the farmer because they have mm. you know, a century of experience behind yeah. them. Yeah. And um, but in many cases, we, especially when we're developing a value chain, because that's what Burke Agro really does, and, and Solar Organic is yeah. a whole team of companies, we develop value chains. We're, we're really um, rethinking the food system and providing those opportunities for brands that want to source um, you know, products that are, that are transparent, that have I, mm -hmm. high verifiable impact, um, mm -hmm. you know, through through metrics and indicators that, that we've set up. Um, so mm -hmm. so those those systems that, that we're looking at in, in the different growers, some some have a system like an agri agroforestry system all set up. Others are total monoculture. And so when we mm -hmm. go into an agroforestry system, how do we help them? It's we become their their resource to fight pests and disease. Um, mm -hmm. We help them. Because like I said, they're poor organic, so maybe they're not uh, working with inputs, or maybe there, there's mm -hmm. new technology that they can use to create molasses mm -hmm. like right there on the farm. Maybe uh, yeah. you know they're not working with the livestock on the farm um, to help aerate the land because um, mm -hmm. they just that's one component that was missing. And so we're tweaking with those farmers, and the changes that they see, which we'll get into in a minute, are are impactful because the the yields will go up or um, mm -hmm. now they've um, now they're planting other crops that we know go well with their main crop. And, and so that, mm -hmm. that other crop will help fight off the pests for their main crop. Um, yeah. 
so that's that's how the agroforestry systems are changing a little bit when, when once we come in for the better um and then the monoculture systems um you know that's when we really get into talk ground cover cover crops right and um mm -hmm. looking at how do we diversify a monoculture farm especially in an area mm -hmm. you know in nicaragua it's it's in some of the areas we work it's the dry corridor and nothing else really grows especially this one area it's underneath a um the prevailing winds that cruise right over a an active volcano and so the mm. acid rain just pours down on these farms Oof. you know over wow you know, 10 10 miles swath of land um and just burns all the all the flowering um on on a mango tree or on a um, like a guanaba, a soursop tree, you know, you name it. So sometimes the only thing that grows there is a cactus, the dragon fruit, or a pineapple. And But a lot of farmers were just focusing on one or the other. So we've been able to work with some of the dragon fruit farmers, and they've got crops that, have, you know, it's it's been there for, you know, these perennials were there for like 20, 30, 40 years already. And so wow. I said, okay, in the wow. alleys, let's start planting um, nitrogen fixers. We can, we can plant jack beans um yeah you know, we can plant pineapple maybe maybe there's room for just one row of pineapple right down the center of the alley um but at the very least you know we need to look at the cover cropping we need to make sure when they're when they're sometimes they've got grass we're working with them like to not use a machete to hack mm -hmm. away at it which releases carbon because the machete keeps going into the soil um and yeah. so th those are some of the techniques that, that we'll use with them um, terrace farming as well. Uh, that's really big with, with uh, a lot of these growers in, um, in the monoculture air or uh, monoculture farms and those zones that are really mountainous. Mm -hmm. So we will, we'll educate them on that. So it's, it's mm -hmm. us providing a resource for both kinds of farmers, tweaking the agroforestry systems, and then really trying to convert the, the, the mindset about how to diversify in this monoculture, mm -hmm. really fragile system, or it's not even a fragile, it's just a, a really degenerated system that they have because nothing else really grows. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we try and yield more um, production, more profit, more diversification um, for mm -hmm. those families? And, and sometimes, you know, it just means planting timber around the perimeter. So we got, mm. and, and planting that timber. So we've got, um, um, protection from the wind. Um, there's better flowering that happens, uh, and then eventually that's hmm. timber that they, they could they could sell. So that's a legacy item, you know, for their for their children. Um, but mm -hmm. those with both groups, what we talk about mostly is soil health and and erosion mm -hmm. and and watershed management and how to how to manage those two main aspects so that their farms become resilient, um, resilient to climate change, right? but also attractive for their families to stay on it. There's a whole other mm. social matter here, which is climate migration, um, migration to the cities, uh, the aging farmer that, that mm. we see today, um, you know, the average age is about 60, probably higher now, uh, you know, 62 mm -hmm. or 63, I bet. So all these farmers are gonna go into retirement and is the farm attractive enough for the, the next generation to feel like they've got a dignified life by staying on that farm? Mm -hmm. And, and so that's, mm -hmm. that's what we try to do is to create, um, a business out of each of these farms. And, and mind you, the smallest ones are about a half acre. Um, wow. and the largest wow. ones are maybe 10. And so how to create this <laughs> business so that the next generation will, the, the, the average size out of those 1200 farmers, the average size is about, uh, 1.4 acres. Um, and so, so Will, how I many farmers just... are you working with? How many individuals? 1,200. Wow. Yeah. And I, I want to just do like a quick recap of like everything I'm hearing, Will, which is like from a business perspective, you came in with the goal to do, you know, basically social enterprise work and create a stable, profitable market for these, for these crops. Right. And that turned into agronomic support, agronomic insights, input financing, financing the farm operations, aggregation processing and even more right which is goes back to this whole design function of if we're going to truly have regenerative systems we can't just be buying an output from the farmer running the cost down as much as possible and then commercializing that on the back end right you're commercializing right, right, that on right. the back end 
doing the exact opposite, investing all of that into building this infrastructure, right? And this ecosystem that then takes those things to market in a much more equitable, right? And, and profitable for the farmer capacity, which is, is beautiful, man. Yeah, yeah thank I'll, you. I'll I want to expand on that too. Oh, well, go ahead. Go, go for it. Please, Scott. I, I was going to say the other part that like is really intriguing to me is like you're doing all this stuff on the ground. And what I love about your story is that you wanted to sell this bulk originally without a brand, without a story. And what you realized was in order to really get the margin that you deserved mm. and that your farmers deserve for the work that's going on is that you needed a brand to tell that story, to be the vehicle for that message. Right. So um, I don't know if now's the right time or not, but I'd like to kind of pivot into more of that brand side. And especially mm. I'm really curious to get your take as a, as a former educator, like how mm. do you take brand education and educating your consumers about the regenerative story, like via the brand of what does that look like for you? Yeah, that's, um, you know, before I answer that, I just want to mention, you know, like climate change and poverty really have the same root cause and it's, and it's mm. extractive economies. Um, mm. and, and so we can't save the planet without taking care of its people first. And mm. so to me, that, that's, that's, that's why we focus so much on this. So um, education, it's, it's a great question, Kyle, because I should rely on, on my education background a little bit more than I do on the marketing side. You know, I mean, I mean, th th think about a teacher. What, what a teacher has to do is they have to go into, well, think about like, like a salesperson, like selling, like selling fax yeah. machines. Like that was like, you know, one of my classmates ended up doing that right out of college. And I was like, Oh, I could yeah. do that. And then, you know, but you know, you're a salesperson goes into a, a meeting or they're, you know, they're presenting something typically to an audience that wants to buy it. <laughs> and it's an mm -hmm. audience of one. Mm -hmm maybe two people mm. and it's something that you practice over and over and over and over you got your pitch and blah, 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 and, and you know it becomes a little well oiled machine a teacher an educator yeah. is is a salesperson trying to sell something to you know 25 or 32 kids that don't want to buy it <laughs> and they've mm. got to you know and, and they're they're you know a lot of them are reluctant to even be at school and um and you're not yeah. just the salesperson you're you're the person who's really trying to enlighten them and and help create contributing contributing members of society and on top of it you're also like their nurse or psychologist they you know the list goes on right and so education for me is so key in what i do but i've always channeled it towards the growers and trying to use education mm -hmm. for them to improve their livelihoods rather than improve our our sales and marketing and and, and reach <laughs> um so th i'm glad right. you brought that up so now i'm like oh shit <laughs> Yeah, I, I may, there's probably more I can do. I, I, maybe I actually have some skills there. <laughs> well, I think so, that speaks um, to so I haven't, yeah, I haven't used it at all. Yeah, but I have. <laughs> but I mean, it's, I I mean, mean <laughs> no, and AC, what I mean by that is you're focused on development on the ground. You're not focused. You're like your goal in starting this this business wasn't like I want to create the best dried fruit snack yeah. brand. You know, like that's yeah. not, that's never been yeah. your goal or priority. Your goal is like the impact yeah. on the ground. So that makes total sense to me. And I would love to see what the result of that, that paradigm shift in your brain, like, how do I utilize my educator, you know, foundation to help develop this brand? I think that'd be really interesting mm -hmm. because one of the key pieces that the entire regenerative movement is missing is that education piece, you know, the, yeah. the lack of unification and the competing certifications and all those different things. I think you are, you're uniquely positioned as a former educator to assist with some of those problems that we're all facing. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 No, th thanks for enlightening me. I just never really looked at it that way. It's, it's you know, because meanwhile, I'm just, I'm helping write curriculums for, for uh, workshops for, you know, growers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, which is good, but that's good. We need that too. Yeah. 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 But uh, you've inspired me. Thank you. We'll talk. Your story we'll inspired talk about me, you know, <laughs> thanks. T talk about ROC and how you saw that as a potential value add, you know, way to communicate the story and going through that whole process and, you know, how you use that to tell the story to, to customers. Yeah, I, th I think there's, there's more opportunity for us to tell that story better um, because, mm. again, you know, I look at things pretty pragmatically on the ground here. Um, yeah. So I, I base the decisions on what's next, what do we need to do to continue to improve our impact, whether it's social or environmental. And so when mm -hmm. regenerative organic certification came about, um, I, I knew that that was our next step because we are pioneers. We've always been pioneering um, yeah. new concepts and, and 
um, here in Nicaragua and soon Guatemala. Um, mm. And so it was just, there wasn't much of a decision tree that was visited um, when, yeah. when we learned about it. It was just, we have to do yeah. this, whether there's a marketing opportunity or margin opportunity, um, it's, it's just, it was necessary because the planet needs it. And, and if we can mm. figure out how to market it, well, great. But, mm -hmm. you know, speaking about marketing, you know, both of you um, sort of pinpointed that. I do think that we're doing our work and the work of everybody else, whether it's in regenerative ag or social impact, a disservice when we're not out there yelling from the hilltops and being on TikTok and creating views and engagement yeah. and not. It's just something we're not really good at, which we're starting to invest in now. So yeah. I think, you know, it, it, it does do the work that we're doing and also for other people a disservice because the more that the consumer and the you know world public hears about this, the more they'll, yeah. they'll become concerned and then the more they'll want to support it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whether it's like by hitting a like button or by actually voting with their dollars and, and um, supporting, you know, supporting these, yeah. these brands um, and the companies and corporations that, that, you know, really put their money where their mouth is. So mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot more to do on the marketing side yeah. of this organic certification. But the reason we did it was, wasn't because of the opportunities there. It was the opportunities for our growers. And then, you know, the, so simple, obviously knew uh, that as a company, it knew that it could use that for its own branding, but we also saw the B2B opportunities. And yeah. if there are other companies that are willing to spend yeah. that dollar in marketing that, mm -hmm. um, that we don't mm -hmm. have to spend, and it means that I can continue developing these value chains for them or, or um, creating better impact with some of the same products we're already working with uh, for our growers, great. And that's mm -hmm. always been my focus. And, and I think it's been in some ways a smart business choice because we haven't had to go through Hell yeah. five rounds of fundraising um, yeah. you know, to, to prop up so simple as a brand and then you know, it never making money. Uh, and then mm -hmm. what would happen to the company? And then what would happen to the work that we're doing on the ground? So, so I've also thought about it in that sense, like let these other companies that we're supplying really, you know, yell from the mountaintop and, and they can be our, our voice in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I can, I can save my money and not save my money, but invest yeah. our capital where, where it's really impactful. You know, mm -hmm. both are impactful, right? But, but I'm much better <laughs> on the field side. Yeah. Yeah, well, you gotta, I think you're, you're solving a huge need right now, right? Yeah. Because as, as a sales guy who works for a brand who's trying to source more regenerative supply, it is so constrained right now. And especially if you've got, you know, rock certified regenerative supply that you can provide mm -hmm. as an ingredient and or like a, a finished good product to a variety mm -hmm. of brands like that need is only going to increase, I would bet mm -hmm. exponentially over the next one, three, five, ten years, right? So if you can continue mm -hmm. to focus on what what feels to be your passion and core competency of developing those supply chains and that value chain, mm -hmm. like you're you're well positioned to really assist with um, the the change we need, right? Because people mm -hmm. want to buy more of these products, and you can you can serve as that source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th th thanks for it's, noting that. I, you know, I fully agree. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. AC. And it's all context, right? Like that's what Regen Ag is about. It's like, what's the what's the most optim, optimal situation and continuous improvement for your context? And your context is what you've said. And you've you've been a little hard on yourself about the lack of brand development or marketing, Will, but I, I'd give you more credit than you give yourself. Um, and it's also like, we got to take a step back and say, the people on this podcast and the people that we hang out with are such on the vanguard of this thing, but the average consumer is still so far behind. And so you've done the right things in yeah. ensuring the supply chain, supporting the farmers, making sure the product's really high quality, making sure the throughput's there from a B2B perspective to support this opportunity in the future in a more stable way rather than let's go raise a bunch of money, let's chase the branded business and let's you know have the best TikTok in the game that maybe won't even translate to, to sales right now. So just a, just a hypothetical, but I think you know, one, give yourself more credit. And two, I think there's a beautiful opportunity uh, within the regenerative value chains around similar commodities or similar branded products. Actually, that's never been available to us from a pre-competitive, you know, collaboration standpoint in CPG. But like when when Soul Simple, Good Sam, Simply, Bronner's, and everyone else that's working in agroforestry systems in the global south can like unite to like tell this awesome, amazing story and like show that the infrastructure investment in these communities and the vertical integration and the various enterprises are like bringing this level of 
uh, you know, re reversing this colonialistic extraction that's happened, but also bringing this wealth back to the smallholder farmers. Like I'm, I, I'm getting tingles just like thinking about it. Like there's so much power in, in that story. And I think this, this still latent capacity for us to collaborate and tell it together. So that, that's very exciting to me personally. Well, th thank you. And, and for sure. And, and, you know, I never answered the second part of your question, which was, what is that? What does that impact look like at the grower level? Mm. You know, how does it affect their yeah. personal lives and their, their livelihood? And, you yeah. know, so I'll just go into it a little bit because all Please. the companies that you mentioned, you know, are definitely providing that kind of impact. They, they are companies that are dedicated to, um, obviously, to regenerative agriculture. But regenerative agriculture has mm. that, that spillover effect that, that you know, you know, intentionally or unintentionally, it's going to help the farmer, whether it's a medium sized farmer, a smallholder farmer, et cetera, um, mm -hmm. because because of that resiliency that the farm's going to have. So um, right. our growers, um, and I'll make it short, you know, some of the changes we see are, you know, like in those monocultural systems, when when we plant wind barriers, um, that means that they've got firewood. They don't have to go mm. um, and deforest. Mm. Um, because mm -hmm. they can just cut down branches from, from, you know, these yeah. hardwoods that, that they've planted. Um, there's less work for, for the whole family. And, and it also helps with gender, gender equity, or, you know, also helps women with 30% of our growers are, are female, by the way. Um, so we do have a gender equity wow. Um, wow. component of, of our mission. Um, and we measure impact on gender equity every year, but, uh, so women also are toiling less. At, in the farm when, when it's um, mm. even, if, even if there's single mothers that own their own farm but you know as a couple as well mm. they're they're toiling less because because their farm is providing more for them they're not having to use cash mm. which is you know just hard to come by and hold on to to go buy some of the things mm. that that the family needs um it's being produced in, mm. in the agriculture systems right there and so we're improving that that impact for them and then what we see is through a poverty uh, index that we we um, um, implement with our it's a survey that we implement with our farmers every year. It's a ten question. We add some more to it for ourselves, but it's an internationally accepted questionnaire, um, and it basically asks like, do you have a wow. blender? Uh, is your floor made of mm. dirt or concrete? Um, what is your mm. roof made out of? Do you own a motorized vehicle? Um, it's just ten basic questions mm. like that, and we can track mm -hmm. the, the improvement of their livelihood through that. Oh, and ha have you a child that has gone to, has graduated from secondary school, university? Mm. And so we see, yeah. I mean, we've got 15 years of data. We see um, yeah. that their livelihoods are improving because their kids are going to university. And, and they're not necessarily studying that's marketing. Cool. They're studying agriculture. They want to come back. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah. that's one of the ways so to see livelihood, livelihoods improving. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Now they do have a concrete floor. Now they've, they've expanded the house. Um, they've got a motorcycle. Uh, some have bought a pickup yeah. truck. Um, you know, the list goes on and on and on. But but it's, it, to me, it's all about education, which is one of the reasons I've, I've always tried to mm -hmm. focus on women, because women really focus on, on education with, with their children. And they prioritize that over a lot of other, um, you know, mm -hmm. polls that, that that they might have with, with their dollar in their hand and where to invest it. More often than not, they're investing in education for their children. And so we try and do whatever we can to support that. Mm. Um, even at the plant level by hiring, um, not restrictively, but, but mostly single mothers. And so, so it's not just, you know, it's not just at the, the farm level where we're seeing impacts also, you know, at our processing right. plant where we've got, you know, depending on the season, we've got 300 to 600 employees there. Um, and so, so wow. there's, there's a story to tell on both sides, actually. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but that's, you know, it's just to answer your question that, that you'd asked earlier, like, what, what does it look like, you know, yeah. when, when, if you were to go visit them, what would it have looked like two years ago? And that would have been the transformation that, that you see. Man, I love that questionnaire, that survey example you provided. Yeah, and cool. man, I, I don't know if there's an opportunity to somehow publish that on the website to show like the, the track record of survey respondents over the last 15 years and the actual impact that's like quantifiable and measurable, which I feel like is so mm -hmm. rare for that type of data. That's just an incredible story. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's really cool. Appreciate you sharing that. And thanks for circling back to that question. 
Um, I do want to try to take it a little bit more to the brand side. And I almost will. I feel like you probably delegate most of these responsibilities to somebody else on your team because you are so impact oriented and on the ground oriented. Mm. But if you can try to answer some of these questions, like what have some of the major hurdles been for you as a smaller regenerative organic brand entering the U.S. market right now? Uh, where, you know, to Anthony's point earlier, a lot of consumers don't really know what that term is yet. So what do those headwinds look like? Where are you getting success? What would you like the market to to do differently? Walk us through some of the brand stuff. Um, Expo West, that's probably the number one challenge. <laughs> Man, that show's changed so much. Um, I say it like kind of in jest, but seriously, it's like 12,000 bucks or more. Probably, probably up, at the end of the day, it's probably 18K for us to have like the smallest, little crappiest booth at that show. Um, and, um, yeah. you know, like just not getting tons and tons of like qualified buyers swinging by, you know, maybe it's our positioning or maybe our message. That's wild. Like, who knows? But Expo West mm. just has been, um, it used to be a great show for us. And, and, uh, now it's just, you know, it's just so expensive that it's hard to justify the investment. So, you know, again, I, I I'm kind of joking about that, but, um, you know, what are the, some of the challenges? It's really like trying to decide what, you know, how to promote the brand, what trade shows to go to. Are there tabletop shows that we, we should visit, you know, for like UNFI or KHE, um, that, that'll be better. Brokers, you know, there are a lot of bad brokers out there. Um, there's some good ones too. Mm. Um, I th mm. But I really, since we're speaking honestly here, I think a challenge <laughs> for us has been not having a team in the U.S., honestly. So we've, yeah. we've run everything out of Nicaragua, mm. um, partly because of, of budget. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're like a medium sized company, actually, we're, you know, we do millions and millions of dollars in sales. Um, but we haven't been able to find a way to dedicate a budget to having a US team. And so I think, you know, maybe with more mm. travel and knocking on doors and, and, and I've offered myself up to the brokers, like, look, when you're going to meet with Sprouts, you're going to meet with uh, Safeway, like, bring me along. No one's going to carry this flag and tell yeah. the story better than me. Um, I, I'd like to be there and like just getting those meetings and, and also me being allowed to be invited to it have been scarce. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. We're the first regenerative organic fruit brand in the world. And uh, we can't mm -hmm. get FaceTime with some of these buyers at, at the grocery stores. Yeah. You know, so that, that's been, that's been the challenge. And so, you know, potentially I just gave you a, a solution. It's just, we need more, more time in the U S and traveling around and I don't know, but, um, <laughs> it's, it, it'd be nice if, if we had a team there, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine, I, I know how hard it is to be a brand and I'm based in the U S I could only imagine how much more difficult it is to take advantage of those opportunities or even to receive those opportunities when you don't have, you know, boots on the ground here in the States, especially yeah. in a category like yours, where I don't want to say it's as competitive as like cold box, right? But dried fruit, right. that's like slat wall, you know, from a, from a merchandising perspective, like having boots on the ground can really change the game with the sorts of opportunities you can get in retail. And uh, yeah, it, it just got to be tough. It's got to be really tough. And again, small brand. And, and again, not, not to discredit, you know, some yeah. of the traction that you've had um, right. relative to the, the greater ecosystem and natural CPG. It's just, it, it's a tough category. It's a big category. And um, yeah, having some boots on the ground, I think would make a huge difference. Well, two, yeah, yeah, two, yeah, th two things that are coming to mind for me too are, yeah, in that category, I can't think of a lot of like, powerhouse brands or household brands. So it's a pretty commoditized category in my opinion. So you really need to get someone like you in front of those buyers to tell that story and get behind a retail execution and a marketing strategy for the retailer that really tells that story and brings a brand forward out of that. Because like, I can't, I can't think of who that is in that space, right? It's a lot of private label. It's probably a couple of brands I can't name off the top of my head. So I think that's like a right. real, that's like a real nodal intervention point for y'all. And then you know, well, I wish you didn't have these problems, but it's like music to my ears in terms of what we're trying to do with the coalition, because, you know, don't quote me on this, but we need to have like the regenerative version of Expo West rolling by 2026, because like, it's not working for our, for our constituents oh, yeah. anymore. Right. So like if we had just right. a focused version with the 150 regenerative brands, retailers would be all over that. Right. And whether it's, whether it's the consumer facing market messaging and storytelling and 
opportunity creation, right? We have to do that on the B2B side as well. So how do we build shared infrastructure that does that programmatically where it's not everyone sword fighting, but us like really having some, 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 maybe that's not the best, <laughs> best analogy, but some shared, you know, higher powered weaponry there. <laughs> no, de- definitely. And, and through a coalition, it, it's, it's a great way to do it because we, we firstly, it's, it's great to be together and share knowledge and experience. Uh, plus mm-hmm. the more that we're together, um, the louder mm-hmm. the, the, you know, battle call becomes or, or, or the, the value proposition that, that we can, we can, you know, share. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it's also safety and number, you know, the, all sorts of reasons to do it together. Um, and I'm, I'm all for yeah. it. And I think a, a show or even, um, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, I, th- I think trade shows, I, I won't, I won't call out Expo West and Expo East anymore um, because yeah. they, they've also provided good opportunities for us in the past as well. But, right. but if there's, if there are opportunities um, where brands like ours um, can be together at those shows um, and also mm-hmm. be acknowledged by having certain kinds of discounts available to us because mm-hmm. we are the ones who are really fighting the fight. Um, mm-hmm. and, and even not just that, like market data is so expensive to come by. Spins, you know, mm-hmm. can spins offer discounts to regenerative certified companies, whatever the certification is. But if you've got a third party mm-hmm. cert, you know, like everyone has to do their part. I don't, I don't see, mm-hmm. um, you know, New Hope doing that. I don't see spins doing that. Those would be opportunities yeah. that that brands like ours that could really use that 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 boost or that that higher profile somehow or, or savings anyway could really use you know um, and that that's what's yeah. going to help impact sales and then impact our growers and and the environmental side as well. Yeah, yeah, I think you touched on something AC's talked about in a previous episode. I'm like, you know. Brands like Soul Simple, who are doing the fantastic work that the planet needs, should really receive some level of benefit from the other industry players, right? And, and Will, you touched on this earlier with, you know, it, it's almost bigger than ag. It's this extractive capitalist mentality that we have as a culture, as a, as a worldview, essentially. And the challenge that regenerative brands face is like they're trying to operate in this best fashion, you know, everybody before themselves within that existing system and you just be it's such an uphill battle um so you know and, th- and that's why we do what we do is we get the opportunity to showcase your story and to explain the challenges uh, and, and give you the opportunity to explain those challenges to the greater industry right um so just just want to comment on that um i also i want to give ac hey, he's chomping a bit for a question here so so go ahead man yeah well, I, I, you said it well, Kyle. I just wanted to add, like, I think some people will hear the last five minutes of this conversation and think, well, that's charity or that's preferential treatment. And like, it's capitalism, mm-hmm. it's competition. Like, yes, but it's really right. not. Like, we have the receipts that we're doing more work and we are internalizing uh, costs that everyone else gets to externalize. So there has to be some sort of incentive or reward structure or that's just not sustainable. And right now, I think the brands individually and collectively have done a good job, like figuring that out and like getting by, but like ultimately if this is the future that we want and everyone wants to write the nice PR clippings and put the headlines out there and, you know, put it out on social and, and, you know, pat themselves on the back for it. Like it's got to translate into balance sheets or it's just not, it's not ever going to work. Right. Right. It needs to translate into our balance sheet, but also, you know, like, like, you know, I, I called out two companies. There are a lot of other companies that, that could probably invest more in, in, regenerative agriculture or fighting climate change I mean, is a better way to put it too. But, you know, here we're, mm-hmm. we're, we're regen advocates, but um, everyone has to do their part, you know, so whether mm-hmm. you're a bank or you're, you know, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll use banking as, as um, an example. Um, in a country like Nicaragua, 90% of the exports, no, sorry, 70% of the exports come from smallholder farmers. And, 90% wow. of them do not have access to financing. And that, that's Nicaragua. Say, but say that, that again, Will. Chronic. Will, say that stat so, again. Repeat, repeat that stat. 70% of the exports out of Nicaragua come from smallholder farmers. And 90% of those growers do not have access to financing. And so that's a that's gap. Wild. It's Insane. a major gap. It's a worldwide gap. I mean, I just gave you Nicaragua as an example, but all, all the global mm-hmm. South has, an, has mm-hmm. that kind of issue. And... There are companies, especially the banking industry, they're they're not comfortable with 
financing non-traditional products. So unless you're in mm-hmm. coffee and rice and sugar, they're not going to finance mm-hmm. you because um, they just mm-hmm. don't know it. And so what yeah. we do, like we, we have to provide credit to our growers. I mean, sometimes it's up to like four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. That, that's cash wow. out of our cash flow that, you know, and that's wow. why we're not you know, able to invest that in marketing and, and, yeah. and it comes at a risk. We don't, we don't collect all of that debt, you know, a, mm. a lot of it we, we do, most of it we do, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. But, but, you know, so what kind of costs are we bearing for that? And there mm. are opportunities, luckily in our development world, there are um, organizations and, you know, yeah. private banks or, or family foundations that'll come in and help, help with that at more favorable interest rates, but there aren't enough. We can't, we can't access mm-hmm. enough just for our small set of growers. So, so even banks mm-hmm. would have an opportunity, you know, and I, just, I don't want to call out, you know, just those two companies I mentioned yeah. before. It's, it's everybody, everybody has a responsibility and, and they can, yeah. they don't have to dig too deep to figure out what they could do to support. Mm. Yeah. You can build the plumbing, but unless there's water to make it flow, it, it doesn't work, right? Which is, we've heard that from, I think, everyone that we've interviewed that's dealing with some sort of smallholder farmer supply chain in the global south, that they're either doing direct financing work themselves, they're giving credit, they're buying up front, or they're leveraging some sort of you know partnership or third parties, and it's still not enough to really cover the gaps and make the cash flows work for for everyone at an optimal you know level. And so, yeah, huge gap that we need to solve for, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's to go with the plumbing uh, analogy, you know, it's like, you know, we're getting tired of pulling people out of the water. We need to go mm. upstream and figure out why they fell in in the first place mm. and financing is mm. one of them. Yeah, yeah totally. Well, and the irony of the bank example, I think, is that, you know, the banks recognize commodity crops. And as a, as a global food system, mm. what we really need to try to do is to decommoditize our food system, right? And so mm. to your point, Will, like if the banks are only recognizing commodities, that makes it really difficult to decommoditize anything. You know, mm-hmm. so it, it again falls on the the brands who are doing the right thing with this additional burden. Like I can't imagine a four to $500,000 cash flow just to finance growers. That is mm. insane. Um, so appreciate you sharing all that, man. It's just, uh, it, it's really eye opening to, to understand. And I'm sure you're only sharing a fraction of what all of the actual, <laughs> you know, challenges on your end are, uh, but it's eye opening to, to really get like a peek behind the tent or behind the curtain, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, happy to share it. And th- thanks for acknowledging it. Yeah. Kyle, let's go to future here. I'll let you tee that. Oh one. man, I was waiting for you to tee it up for the last one, but yeah, we'll, we'll say way to future. So, Will, you you mentioned before Guatemala um, and how that could be coming up a little bit. You know, you, you might start working there. So, I'm curious from like a future perspective, is Guatemala like an additional product that's coming to market, an additional you know fruit that you're working with, or just some more geography? Are there you know opportunities to expand your company right now from like a, a product perspective? Is there some innovation in the pipeline? Talk to us about the future of the brand and what you have in store. Yeah, so um, I, I, can, I can kind of put into two buckets. Um, both are unrelated. Guatemala is a great opportunity for us. Um, as you know, it's, it's smart to have redundancy in a supply chain um, and also mm-hmm. to have, um, I mean, we're in the land of lakes and volcanoes in Nicaragua. I mean, the hurricanes mm-hmm. should be in the in that sentence too, but um, you know, yeah. we've, we've had climactic issues, um, fires even, you know, that, that take out some crops. Um, there could be disease or pests that, that, you know, could just come in and wipe out a crop. I mean, it, less of a chance of that because, you know, most of our growers are with, uh, agroforestry systems now. So that's really mitigated some of that risk, but, but it's just good looking at it from, an, um, economics, business, politics, um, and, and good business practice of having that redundancy. So Guatemala presents a lot of the same fabric and, and um, I'd say culture that Nicaragua gives us mm. with mm. better access to ports, um, lower freight costs, um, lower cost of energy. So we think our cost structure would probably go down. Well, our, yeah, our cost structure mm. would be improved and, and so our costs would mm. go down by operating in Guatemala. Um, and there's also more development opportunities there. Um, the U S government has decided that they 
they want to take a look a deeper look at climate migration um we're in a mm -hmm. perfect position to be able to implement projects for them um which mm -hmm. will then in turn you know connect guatemalan growers to a sustainable market um and wow. so whether we end up actually processing there um is it's still being determined we, that's our plan um but at the very mm -hmm. least burke agro which as, you know i mentioned earlier is that's the development um arm of, of yeah. our company um they can do that development work in guatemala and then build up some value chains and then we can in, you know by renting a plant moving some equipment from here up there buying new equipment we can begin processing but we just need to get those value mm -hmm. chains developed now what are we going to grow um i'm not going to say specifically what, what we're doing but uh we're open to developing <laughs> anything for anybody <laughs> because we're experts <laughs> at it um, and if yeah, you look at Guatemala right. and Nicaragua, all of Central America, actually 70% of what can be grown in the world as ingredients can be grown in Central America. So wow. uh, corn, huge corn, opportunity, rice. Yeah. 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 I mean, we can grow almost any, strawberries, apples, mm -hmm. grapes, like in Guatemala yeah. is great because they've got these high plateaus, but, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah, if you think about it, you know, lemongrass, I mean, all these basic ingredients wow. that, that all the, you know, the, the, the food system needs, um, mm -hmm. you know, can be grown there that we can't supply 70% of, of yeah. what's consumed, right. but right. of those ingredients, you know, that ingredient list, 70% of those can be grown there. So, so it's really unique, but we're going to focus on fruit, uh, mostly, uh, juices and purees, um, possibly some IQF, um, individually quick frozen fruits. Um, nice. And um, hopefully do it with, with renewable energy as well, solar panel technology, just Let's process go. during the day. Yeah. So Let's that's, that's, that's cool. Guatemala. Yeah. Now, what else do we have in the pipeline? Um, we, we've been processing uh, flowers lately, cassava mm. and green banana flower. And, mm. um, Interesting. It, and the more that we can get into like these, these basic foodstuffs, I think the mm. more impact we can create here in, in Central America. Um, so using those ingredients, especially for the gluten-free, um, yeah. you know, market, um, which is, it's growing so quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity for us there and, and, and to diversify growers into that because we can exactly. totally yeah, intercrop that with, with our current systems, mm -hmm. um, and, and, yeah. and get it certified right away. Um, there's, there's a lot that we can plant right now and get certified as regenerative organic right away. So, so we're excited about that. Yeah. That's two super cool opportunities. I am really curious about green banana flower because as someone I've worked in this food industry for about, over 10 years now, I've never heard anybody talk about green banana flower. So I need to know more about that. Like, is that like a one-to-one -one replacement of regular all-purpose flour? Is that you know, like an almond flour alternative? Like talk to me about that product. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot because it was our, our marketing team that decided that that's, that's the one we need to go into. And it was our uh, field team wow. that said we can definitely do it. And then our manufacturing huh. plant team that said, oh, for sure, we, you know, we've got the right mills. We already do powders for, we do cataya mm, powder, actually. And so they said, yeah, we can wow. do it. So it's still being developed. What I do know is that it as, a, as an ingredient is an alternative um, for a lot of um, like, like, comes like crackers and um, like pancake mixes. Or, you know, so it can be used yeah. in that sense. Now... Um, the nutritional benefits are super high in potassium, obviously, and th that's about all I know of it. So I'm super embarrassed to, to say that. But, you know, like you said earlier, I'm, I'm focused on on the development side and our other right. teams totally focused on that. And they, they, they took the took the reins and, and trotted away with it. Um, it's just a so cliffhanger for your it. second episode. Don't worry yeah. about it. Well, it's just to a totally, yeah. Whatever episode happened episode to the you. banana powder? You know? Do you even know what it is? <laughs> um, I'm so curious uh, about this stuff. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's, no, but, but, but I mean, you're, you're, you're in the same boat as a lot of people. It, it's super new. Um, and, uh, I, th I think it's going to be more than just a trend, uh, because yeah. of that. And, and yeah. because it can come from, it can come from, um, agroforestry systems, you know, I mean, totally. And this was, that's what's so intriguing to me. Alt flower is such a booming category right now. And if you can develop a new entrant to that category that starts with regenerative, like, and you set that mm -hmm. as the precedent, that is like such a massive opportunity for, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody, right? So I, it's just, it's super intriguing, super exciting to me. So I can't wait to learn more when, when the time comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm pretty intrigued by it too, but um, apparently not intrigued enough to have sat down with all the literature on it yet, but 
You got plenty on your desk. Give yourself a break. break. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know what I'm doing tonight when I'm going to bed. <laughs> the the theme there for me is the last 50 years of product development has driven monoculture and has driven down agrobiodiversity and all the product development we talk about on this podcast drives biodiversity and enables diversified increased farmer livelihoods and incomes and like everything you just said came back to that right which I think is is amazing um will last question to take us home and this has been a super fun informative conversation thank you um how do we get regen brands that have 50% market share by 2050 50% market share. Okay. So we're talking almost 25 years, 27 years from now. Um, po- policy, I think is key. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, the U S isn't the end all be all of, of, um, trends and, and guidance and market and, and how to, um, mm-hmm. produce, you know, how to farm better said. We're not the yeah. end all be all, but you know, we're all Americans here. And so I'll just focus on us policy and start there. Yeah. Us policy with, um, with our corn farmers is just, you know, without going too deep into it, it's, I, I see it as being really backwards. We need to support yeah. farmers that can diversify their crops into yeah. products that are not just producing high fructose corn syrup, uh, which is killing us. Uh, yeah. it's public enemy number one, sugar and high fructose corn syrup. Um, and get them on products that that are healthy and will create mm-hmm. better diets, better habits for us, uh, better soil health for them, um, mm-hmm. build soil health or build soil, and um, mm-hmm. you know create more nutrient density in their mm-hmm. soil, um, so that they're able to not just well, <laughs> firstly become resilient to climate change, but also yeah. um, hopefully start to sequester carbon, which is something that mm-hmm. we haven't even gotten into. Um, yeah. But, but they, you know, U S policy needs to really start focusing on that with, with America's farmers, I think, and incentivizes them to produce, yeah. you know, what we need, produce what the world needs, but, um, but also diversify them in the crops that are going to make us more healthy um, and mm-hmm. crops that will sequester carbon. And so the American consumer, then that's where the marketing side comes in needs to be educated on it. And so that that's going to take, again, you know, US government funding to, you know, create uh, marketing campaigns. I mean, I, I grew up with Smokey the Bear and give a hoot, don't pollute. Uh, yeah. Those are really important messages, mm-hmm. you know? But, so wh- where's the next yeah. one? I've got kids. Yeah. I've never seen a commercial like that on TV. Yeah. <laughs> you know, since the 70s mm-hmm. and the 80s. Um, mm-hmm. so, so I think, you know, our US government needs to do it and they need to be pushed. And I think that's where, you know, mm. we start pushing Congress members and senators to, to do that. That's, yeah. I think that's, that's what needs to happen because, and then we need to have a collective loud voice. And so we probably need to be the ones along with consumers that, that are pushing that. Um, so we have our coalition. Yeah. Um, so we need to organize. So th- that's, that's probably how we get there. We organize, communicate with the senators and, and, you know, with data um, and, and show what, you know, Americans need. Um, and then, and then get them to, you know, start marketing on their own and, and implementing policies. So without knowing much about American politics, I've been overseas for 25 years. So <laughs> yeah. Maybe it sounds a lot easier. I think you it nailed is. it on the head. I think you nailed it on the head. Even, even, even with that. Uh, Agreed. Yeah, you know, well, uh, Dr. Mark Hyman has a great book called food fix and he talks a lot about the corn subsidies and like that What's What's mind blowing to me, not only do they subsidize the farming of the high fructose corn syrup, they then mm-hmm. subsidize the purchasing because a lot of that high fructose corn syrup goes to soda, right? And in a number of other places, yeah. and it's not the soda is the only culprit. But thirty three percent of all soda sales come from food stamps, so the government is also directly subsidizing a massive chunk of that revenue for those companies. And it's just like, man. And then they take mm-hmm. on the burden of, you know, via Medicare, Medicaid, whatever. And obviously, yeah. I'm not advocating against the insurance, sure. but all those people yeah, who end up sick or issues. paying again a third time. Exactly. And you just, it's so, it just doesn't make any sense. So I think you're spot on. I think policy has got to be one of the big ones. Um, and I also love the, the collective, like we need to amplify our voice and work together yeah. to raise awareness. I think you're, you're absolutely you know, hitting the nail on the head. Yeah. I can, I can add one more. Uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it was at the RFSI forum last year and AC, you might remember the number, but I remember that mm-hmm. 
in one presentation, they were talking about there's potentially up to $1 trillion of capital that can be unlocked that could be invested mm -hmm. in regenerative agriculture. And it's the question, mm -hmm. you know, how do, how do, well, the capital's there. It's, it's, mm -hmm. They say that it's, it's ready to go and it's been, it's just not executed yet. Like those, those, that's, that's the capital that's like looking for deals right now. They're about to exit something and they're ready to enter into something mm -hmm. else. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's obviously the, the second component to it. It's, it's policy, but also the capital from the private markets, the private capital markets need, mm -hmm. need to invest mm -hmm. in this. So, and that, and that way you've got two prongs and if one, if one's not going forward, at least the other one is, but I don't know how to convince mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> $1 trillion worth of capital markets to, to invest in your agenda yeah. bag, but, but we, we've done, a, we've done a little bit. We, we did get yeah. some PE money a little, a little while ago. So nice. We're, we're gaining on it. The two biggest issues there is the majority of the climate funding is going to clean energy and it's going into engineered solutions versus nature-based solutions. Right. And yeah. all these things are so interlocked. We talk about investing in women. We talked about investing in poverty alleviation. Like that's the best way to actually eliminate climate change but you don't think about it like that, right? You think about, let's put a direct air capture machine that costs a billion dollars in the middle of uh, yeah. you know, nowhere, Montana and suck carbon out of there. It's like, no, that's, that's not it, right? It's agriculture, it's mangrove restoration, it's biodiverse landscapes, Absolutely. it's you know, it's not building a wall to keep immigrants out, but giving them better livelihoods in where they're from. You know, it's like all these, it's all these things and not to get too political, but you know, that, that's it's it's all above my pay grade but at a high level you begin to see all the linkages and just the fact that like we are significantly stunted if we don't unlock some of those dams because they're they're what's really holding things back yeah yeah amen totally stunted yeah well brother this was an amazing conversation learned a ton I'm really excited to share with our audience so just thanks for making the time and thanks for all the work that you're doing Thank you. Thanks for the work you're doing. It's great to have a platform where we can sing to, to the, to the public and, uh, you know, educate them a little bit and also, uh, you know, uh, share what we do. And, uh, I'm yeah. really, really happy to have had this opportunity to be with you guys. Thank you. Absolutely, man. Before we close, I want to make sure that, uh, any listener interested gets the opportunity to jump on the website. That's soul S O L simple.com. Um, check out their products. You know, I, I, I have not tried the dried banana, so I will be sure to everything Got else is to. fantastic. Um, but well, yeah, thanks again for your time and sharing, sharing all the great work you're doing. Thanks. Will. thank you. Likewise. Thank you. For show notes, episode transcripts, and more information on our guests and what we discuss on the show, check out our website, regen-brands.com. That is regen-brands.com. You can also find our Regen Recaps on the website. Regen Recaps take less than five minutes to read and cover all the key points of the full hour-long conversations. You can check out our YouTube channel, Regen Brands Podcast, for all of our episodes with both video and audio. The best way to support our work is to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, subscribe to future episodes, and share the show with your friends. Thanks for tuning in to the Regen Brands Podcast, brought to you by the Regen Coalition and Outlaw Ventures. We hope you learned something new in this episode and it empowers you to use your voice, your time, and your dollars to help us build a better and more regenerative food system. Love you guys.